and advisor to Venezuela. The text of the memorandum was only made public in 1949, a month after the death of its supposed author. 13 more years passed before Venezuela first invoked it in the run-up to the independence of Guyana. Curiously, Venezuela made almost no mention of this document yesterday. Could this be because Venezuela or maybe its council know that the document is replete with errors, a litany of sweeping conjecture and totally 100% unsubstantiated allegations. The contemporaneous evidence in the record, private diary entries, correspondence from the distinguished arbitrators and so on, confirms that the members of the arbitral tribunal discharged their responsibilities conscientiously and with scrupulous independence. The record reveals thousands of pages of written arguments and evidence more than 200 hours of oral hearings, spread over more than 50 sitting days, followed by long debate about the issues before the arbitrators. It shows that at the outset, the arbitrators held differing views on where precisely the boundary lay. But following an intensive process of discussion, debate, and mutual compromise, a process which no doubt is very familiar to each of you, the arbitrators reached a unanimous conclusion. There is not a shred of evidence, literally nothing, to show that the outcome was predetermined or coerced. Quite the contrary. As one of the Venezuelan appointed arbitrators, Justice Brewer, explained on the day of the award, until the last moment, I believed a decision would be quite impossible and it was by the greatest conciliation and mutual concessions that a compromise was arrived at. If any of us had been asked to give an award, each would have given one differing in extent and character. The consequence of this was that we had to adjust our different views, and finally to draw a line running between what each thought right. The contemporaneous evidence is clear. And three points may be made. First, the evidence shows that the British arbitrators were persuaded by Professor Martins to make concessions during the tribunal's deliberations, and they were frustrated about the extent of the concessions they had made. In his private diary, which is well worth reading, Professor Martins described how the tribunal's deliberations had involved a fierce debate between the arbitrators. Professor Martins persistently demanded that the British arbitrators had to make concessions to the Americans, and he persuaded them to waive and modify their positions during the course of the deliberations. Professor Martins recorded in his diary how Lord Russell waived his line, ceding a significant area to the Venezuelans. And he added, Eager to recruit the American arbitrators, I demanded another concession from the British side. Professor Martins explained that the British arbitrators were apparently angry that one, under my influence, they had to waive something that, as they considered already belonged to them, and two, that due to the unanimity which I persistently demanded, they had to make concessions to the Americans. This evidence by a renowned Russian jurist, by one of the world's great jurists, on which Venezuela has passed in total silence, is difficult to reconcile with the allegation that the award was somehow the result of an illicit Anglo-Russian political deal. Second, the suggestion of a secret deal to favour Great Britain at the expense of Venezuela is inconsistent with the outcome, one that gave the most prized and valuable strategic asset, the mouth of the Orinoco River, to Venezuela. On the day of the award, Mr. Malay Prevost and another of Venezuela's council, the former United States President, Benjamin Harrison, celebrated the win. Venezuela's ambassador to Britain, 
acclaimed the award as allowing justice to, in his words, shine forth, giving Venezuela exclusive dominion over the Orinoco, which was the principal aim we sought to achieve through the arbitration. Even the Malay Prevost Memorandum recognizes that the award gave to Venezuela the most important strategic point at issue. Again, the evidence in the record before you totally contradicts all of Venezuela's allegations. And third, the justice of the 1899 award and the fact that it did not unduly favor Great Britain is also reflected by the fact that the boundary determined by the tribunal corresponded closely to the line previously identified by the Venezuelan Boundary Commission appointed by United States President Grover Cleveland. In the words of one member of that commission, the line determined by the 1899 award was thoroughly just. And it is with pride and satisfaction that I find there, that's to say the tribunal's award, agreeing substantially with the line which, after so much trouble, our own commission had worked out. To conclude, the claim that the 1899 award was the product of improper collusion and a secret political deal is as outrageous as it is unsubstantiated. It is contradicted by the evidential record and by the outcome of the arbitration. It is fanciful. There is, we submit, no realistic prospect of Venezuela persuading the court that the award is invalid on this basis. Which is precisely why, with respect, Venezuela now scrapes the barrel with its concocted newfound monetary gold argument. Mr. Reichler has explained the UK has since 1966 had no legal interest in the validity or invalidity of the award, much less any legal interests that could conceivably be said to constitute the very subject matter of the issues the court has been called upon to decide. Beyond that, the monetary gold principle is not engaged at all because the United Kingdom has consented to these proceedings and it has allowed the court to resolve this outstanding controversy. So let us turn to the 1966 agreement, which you know very well. We listened with great interest to the various submissions of counsel for Venezuela, and we noted the total failure to address at all the legal terms of that instrument, which is at the heart of these proceedings, the agreement that formed the basis of the court's clear and correct December 2020 judgment. For Venezuela, it seems, the 1966 agreement is the legal instrument that dares not speak its name. In the light of the 1966 agreement, the monetary gold argument is wholly misconceived. The agreement reflects the clearest expression by the United Kingdom that it accepts that it has no role at all in, as Article 1 puts it, the practical settlement of the controversy, which has arisen as the word of 1899 is null and void. The United Kingdom is a party to that agreement, by which it has unambiguously and explicitly affirmed that it shall have no role whatsoever in any aspect of the practical settlement of any part of that controversy. Whether that recognition is characterized as an expression of consent to the procedure being followed without its involvement, or as a waiver of any rights it may normally have in the conduct of those processes, including judicial processes, matters not. Either way, the United Kingdom has accepted that the object of the Geneva Agreement was to seek a solution to the frontier dispute between the parties that originated from their opposing views as to the validity of the 1899 award. 
That's the way this court put it in paragraph 65 of the 2020 judgment. And that the United Kingdom will have no role in any of the procedures that may be utilized to reach that solution. In paragraph 66, and the government of Venezuela. There is no role for the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom accepted by this binding treaty obligation that it would have no role in the work of the mixed commission, none whatsoever. That included with respect to any consideration by the mixed commission of any factual allegations that touched upon the question of the validity of the 1899 award. In other words, the United Kingdom accorded to Guyana and Venezuela alone the power to engage with the Mixed Commission on all the allegations of British wrongdoing, fraud, or any of the other horrors that Venezuela now claims, or newly claims, to have been perpetrated by perfidious Albion, and to do so without any involvement of the United Kingdom whatsoever. The United Kingdom did not create a carve-out to forbid the Mixed Commission from dealing with such matters. The 1966 agreement places no limits on the competence or powers of the Mixed Commission to resolve the outstanding controversy. And the same goes for all the other processes envisaged by the agreement. Article 4, paragraph 1, for example, provides that the Mixed Commission may, in its final report, refer to the government of Guyana and the government of Venezuela any outstanding questions. No mention of the United Kingdom. Those governments, i.e. Guyana and Venezuela, shall, without delay, choose one of the means of peaceful settlement provided in Article 33 of the Charter of the United Nations. Now, Madam President, may I make two points? Those governments refers only to the governments of Guyana and Venezuela, not the United Kingdom. And second, the means of peaceful settlement provided for in Article 33 of the UN Charter embraces judicial settlement, including resort to the International Court of Justice as the court explicitly recognized in paragraph 82 of its judgment of 2020, which is res judic. By article four, paragraph one, the United Kingdom has explicitly accorded to Guyana and Venezuela the sole right to refer the controversy or any part of it to this court without any involvement on the part of the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom cannot itself refer the controversy to the court. The United Kingdom cannot be a respondent in any case under the agreement. And like Article 2, Article 4, Paragraph 1 makes no provision to carve out from any such proceedings before the court any issues relating to allegations of 19th century wrongdoing by the United Kingdom of the kind of which we heard yesterday. Put simply, the 1966 agreement places no limit to the jurisdiction or the exercise of the jurisdiction of the court to resolve the controversy. Again, to draw from your paragraph 82 in the 2020 judgment, if the parties to the 1966 agreement had wished to exclude allegations of 19th century British wrongdoing being addressed by the court in any proceedings referred to it under Article 4.1, they could have done so in the negotiations, but they did not do so. 
and exactly the same conclusions apply in relation to a referral to this court by the Secretary General of the United Nations under Article 4, Paragraph 2. And so, against this background, is it really imaginable that the negotiators of the 1966 agreement intended with one hand to accord to Guyana and Venezuela or to the Secretary General the power to refer to the court the controversy concerning the question of the validity of the 1899 award, but simultaneously, with the other hand, to remove that power by requiring the court to exercise the jurisdiction granted to it to resolve the controversy because of the application of the monetary gold principle. Let me be blunt. Such a conclusion would be absurd. It would deprive Article 4 of any effet utile. It would render Article 4 a dead letter in relation to judicial settlement by this court or indeed by any other judicial or arbitral process, since the parties to the 1966 agreement knew full well that any resolution of the controversy would necessarily have to address the arguments made by Venezuela with respect to allegations of 19th century wrongdoing by the United Kingdom. And this, presumably, is why Venezuela chose to steer so wide a berth yesterday around the 1966 agreement, including the crucial language of Article 4. The lawyers of Venezuela know, as we know, and as you surely know, that by negotiating, signing, and bringing into effect the 1966 agreement, the United Kingdom very obviously gave its consent to the court to exercise the jurisdiction you have ruled the court has. To accede to Venezuela's application would be to recognize that the United Kingdom contributed to a legal instrument that gave the court jurisdiction, but simultaneously withheld its consent to allow the court to exercise that jurisdiction. There is nothing in the plain meaning of the 1966 agreement to support such a conclusion. Quite the contrary. There's nothing in the object and purpose of the 1966 agreement to support such a conclusion. Quite the contrary. A good friend, Professor Tams, asked a question. Would you, the court, in deciding upon Guyana's claims, have to rule upon the United Kingdom's conduct without its consent? The answer to that question is totally plain. It is no. There is no other way of looking at this, one that also makes clear that the monetary gold principle can be of no avail to Venezuela in this case. The 1966 agreement, and in particular the provisions of Articles 2 and 4, for the practical settlement of the controversy, make it clear that the United Kingdom recognised that going forward, the only two parties which were directly interested in the resolution of the controversy were Guyana and Venezuela. By the agreement, the United Kingdom accepted that it would no longer be an interested party. And Venezuela has recognized this reality and articulated it as this court itself noted in its 2020 judgment. I refer you to your own paragraph 74, in which the court set out its conclusion that Guyana and Venezuela had conferred on the Secretary General the authority to choose a means for the settlement of the controversy that would be binding on them. And then in the following paragraph, paragraph 75, the court wrote, you can see it on the screens, this conclusion is also supported by the position of Venezuela, set out in its exposition of motives for the draft law ratifying the protocol of Port of Spain of 22nd of June 1970, in which it is stated that the possibility existed 
that an issue of such vital importance as the determination of the means of dispute settlement would have left the hands of the two directly interested parties to be decided by an international50 years. At no point during the 27-year good office process did Venezuela ever suggest that it was somehow necessary to engage with the United Kingdom concerning any aspect of the controversy over the validity of the 1899 award and the related issue of the party's land boundary. This remained Venezuela's position and including the memorandum it submitted to this court on November the 28th, 2019, which contained no hint of its newly concocted argument that the United Kingdom is somehow a necessary third party with a continuing legal interest in the matter. I refer you to paragraph 70 of Venezuela's 2019 memorandum which explicitly states that the court's jurisdiction was legally dependent on both parties' consent to the jurisdiction of the court. The memorandum says nothing about the need for the United Kingdom to be a party in any way to the proceedings, an argument which Venezuela full well knew as recently as 2019 was totally hopeless given the plain meaning of the 1966 agreement. Fifty years on, may be assisted by a new team of lawyers and in direct contravention to decades of practice before the Mixed Commission and the good offices of the UN Secretary General, in the course of which Venezuela was entirely 100% consistent to proceed without any United Kingdom involvement, all of a sudden, magically, Suddenly, conveniently, the United Kingdom has become a directly interested party. I turn to the conduct of the United Kingdom in the six decades since Guyana attained independence, following on from what Mr. Reichler said to you. That conduct is totally inconsistent with Venezuela's monetary gold argument. At no time since granting Guyana independence on the 26th of May 1966, has the United Kingdom ever asserted, claimed, or even hinted that it has any possible interest in either the question of the validity of the 1899 award or the location of the boundary between Venezuela and Guyana or any aspect of any matter that might have to be decided in relation to the resolution of those issues? Not once. Never. Jamais. This is for the simple reason that in 1966, at the date of Guyanese independence, the UK expressly and unambiguously relinquished any such interest or claim. The absence of any relevant legal interest on the part of the United Kingdom is reflected in the legal instrument through which the United Kingdom gave effect to the grant of independence. It is the Guyana Independence Act of 1966, section one of which was enacted by the British Parliament on the eve of Guyana's independence in May 1966. It provided that, as you can see on your screens, on and after the 26th of May 1966, Her Majesty's Government in the United Kingdom shall have no responsibility for the government of the territory, which immediately before that day constitutes the colony of British Guyana and which on and after that day is to be called Guyana. And thus, from the date of Guyana's independence, the UK unequivocally and explicitly gave up any claim to any rights in respect of the territory, which immediately before independence had been the territory of the British colony. It accepted 
that it had no legal interests in relation to the status of that territory or in any process that would determine the status of that territory. And the United Kingdom has also expressly disavowed any interest in the question of the validity of the 1899 award or the location of the Guyana-Venezuela land boundary. Indeed, the British government has even gone further. It has stressed that it would be positively inappropriate for the United Kingdom to play any role, whether active or otherwise, in relation to the controversy between Guyana and Venezuela concerning those questions. Unlike Venezuela, it seems, the United Kingdom has no interest in a continuing role for the former colonial power. As early as 1968, for example, the British Minister of State for Foreign and Commonwealth Affairs told the United Kingdom Parliament that, I quote, you can see it on the screens, Guyana put her signature to the Geneva Agreement and as an independent country is now negotiating with Venezuela. The meetings are continuing and although there has been much progress, so far the matter is being discussed as it should be discussed by two independent countries. And two years later, in March 1970, after the Mixed Commission failed to yield a resolution of the controversy, another British government minister told Parliament that, I quote, it is our sincere hope that the problems between the two parties will be solved peacefully by the two independent countries concerned as provided for in the Geneva Agreement. It imposed obligations on both sides. It established the procedure which they should follow if they failed to agree. They are still discussing, so we must hope that they will reach agreement or otherwise follow the procedure in the agreement. There is no hint, none, of the United Kingdom having any continuing legal interest, as opposed to a political interest in trying to be helpful, in the outcome of discussions between Guyana and Venezuela, two independent countries, and certainly not a legal interest that could be said in any way to constitute the very subject matter of the issues in discussion. Nor is there any hint anywhere in the evidence of any concern on the part of the United Kingdom that the outcome of the procedure that is to be followed might somehow shed a negative light on past British actions. Eleven years later, in 1981, the British government summarised its official position to the United Kingdom Parliament in the following terms. There is, of course, no question of our changing our historical view of the 1899 award. However, now that Guyana is independent and a sovereign state, we believe that it would not be right for us to take an active part in pursuing the settlement of the controversy. It is for the governments of Venezuela and Guyana to settle this matter between themselves. As the House will know, neither the Geneva Agreement nor the Port of Spain Protocol provides for any further action on the part of the United Kingdom after Guyanese independence. In these circumstances, it would not seem either appropriate or helpful for Her Majesty's Government now to play an active role in the controversy. This position, which disposes entirely of the application, is also reflected in a document contained in the new material which Venezuela filed last week but somehow didn't notice the implications of. On the 5th of October 1983, the UK Foreign and Commonwealth Office sent a letter to the UK diplomatic mission in New York. This is what it stated. Finally, you will know that ministers maintain the position that we should be very cautious about any attempts to re-involve HMG in this dispute. You will note that while we have an interest in the smooth working of the Geneva Agreement, we do not consider that the agreement envisages any further role for the United Kingdom. Any further role. 
I know you will have fully in mind the need not to leave the impression with anyone that we consider we still have locus standi in the dispute. No locus standi, no legal interest. It could not be clearer. There's one further point to be made about Venezuela's monetary gold argument, and it's been mentioned already. It is state succession, decolonization, and self-determination. On Venezuela's case, notwithstanding the fact that Guyana had become fully independent more than half a century ago, the United Kingdom, as its former colonial power, somehow retains an ongoing legal interest in the 1897 treaty, in the 1899 arbitral award, and in the 1905 boundary agreement. The indisputable fact is that the United Kingdom's interests passed long ago to Guyana when it became an independent sovereign state in 1966. Venezuela's preliminary objection is premised on a belief that the process of decolonization is somehow incomplete, inchoate, or imperfect. It seems to suggest that notwithstanding General Assembly Resolution 1514 and its independence since 1966, Guyana's liberation from the shackles of colonialism is somehow only partial, that it is in some way still subject to a lingering residue of the colonizer's interest, like a teenage child somehow dependent upon the continued largesse of its parent. For a country that has so long proclaimed itself to be anti-colonial, this is, to put it generously, a rather curious position to adopt. If Venezuela is right, then it would seem to follow that any former colonial power anywhere in the world would retain a continuing legal interest in respect of any potential judicial determination, for example, of the boundaries of any of its former colonies, where such determination turned in some way on some impugned act of the former colonial power. This, with respect, totally offends against the law of state succession and the law of decolonization. At the same time, it would also provide any party to a dispute arising from a colonial era boundary, boundary treaty, and as we know, there are a great many of them, with a very simple mechanism for preventing this court, or indeed any other international tribunal, from exercising such jurisdiction as it has over the dispute. Simply allege fraud or some other horrendous act against the former colonial power, and hey presto, monetary gold applies. And the case cannot proceed because jurisdiction cannot be exercised without the participation of the former colonial power. You can see the mischief that will follow if you come close to accepting this argument. It's not so much a case of poudre aux yeux, as Professor Palchetti put it. It's more like this court running into a brick wall. These unprincipled and frankly repugnant possibilities find no support in the case law or in the world as it really is. On the contrary, as noted in Guyana's written submissions, the court has frequently and regularly determined boundary disputes between former colonies of different colonial powers based on colonial era treaties or other instruments without the involvement of the former colonial parties to those treaties and without any legal issues or difficulties arising. To conclude, and I will be blunt, the reality is in us doesn't really truly regard the United Kingdom as an indispensable third party to these proceedings. The reality, as everyone in this room knows, is that the United Kingdom has no legal skin in this game. 
and Venezuela and its council know that. The reality is that Venezuela's preliminary objections are a concoction, a late attempt to derail the process to prevent this court from delivering the impartial and authoritative ruling which will finally bring this controversy to a legal end. Madam President, for the reasons I and Mr. Reichler have summarised, Venezuela's preliminary objections are incoherent, legally misconceived and factually baseless. The preliminary objections totally ignore the realities of the 1966 agreement and the court's jurisprudence on the indispensable third party. They ignore Venezuela's own conduct over decades. They ignore the conduct of the United Kingdom over decades. The former colonial power whose purported interests Venezuela now suddenly claims actually go to the very essence of this case. They ignore the fundamental precepts of state succession, decolonization and self-determination. They are, in short, totally hopeless. For these reasons, and for the additional reasons summarized by my colleagues, Professor Darjan and Ms. Bahari, the preliminary objections must be rejected. Madam President, members of the Court, I thank you very much for your kind attention. I take the opportunity to thank Mr. Edward Craven for his assistance in preparing these submissions. This concludes Guyana's first round of oral arguments. We wish you all a wonderful weekend. Thank you very much. I thank Professor Sands, whose statement brings to an end today's sitting, as well as the first round of oral argument. The court will reconvene on Monday, 21 November 2022, at 10 a.m. to hear Venezuela's second round of oral pleadings. At the end of that sitting, Venezuela will present its final submissions. Guyana will present its second round of oral argument on Tuesday, 22 November 2022 at 10 a.m. At the end of that sitting, Guyana will also present its final submissions. Each party will have a maximum of 45 minutes to present its arguments for the second round. As the parties and their counsel turn to their preparation for the second round of oral proceedings, I take this opportunity to remind them of Article 60, Paragraph 1 of the Rules of Court, pursuant to which the oral statements of the second round are to be as succinct as possible. The court has emphasized this requirement in practice direction six. The parties should not use the second round to repeat statements that they've previously made. The second round is an opportunity to respond to points that were made earlier in these oral proceedings. Moreover, the parties are not obliged to use all the time allotted to them. The sitting is adjourned.